pessoa muito especial. É talvez o intelectual americano mais conhecido no mundo e mais respeitado. Vamos ver de quem se trata. Aí, professor Chomsky. Welcome, Mr. Chomsky. It's an honor for me to have you here. Thank you for being here. Glad to be with you. Tell me, after six months of the Trump government, it's possible to say what about Trump, the administration, the Trump administration? Well, there's, on the one hand, Trump, on the other hand, the administration. Mm -hmm. And they're somewhat different. Uh, Trump is basically a showman. Uh, he, you can, he wants to make sure that every day uh, he's right at the top of the television news. They concentrate on him, and uh, the headlines are about him. And that means doing one strange performance after another. That's the only way to keep the television cameras focused on you. And it works. Mm -hmm. If you look over the past six months, uh, every day, uh, turn on... BBC, uh, look at the New York Times, that's the Twitter. Front. That's what it starts with. But his administration, his The administration politics. is something else. Uh, you have to look at people like Paul Ryan, um, it, uh, who was Svengali behind the administration. He's there, he represents the most savage wing of the traditional Republican Party, uh, the wing that's deeply dedicated to providing support for private power, uh, corporate power, and uh, everything else can be dismissed. In fact, if you look at his actual proposals for the budget, they essentially eliminate the federal budget, mm -hmm. except for the military and support for private wealth and corporate power. And step by step, that's what they're doing. They take a look every day, usually by stealth, something is happening. So, for example, while all attention was focused on the Twitters about uh, transgenders in the military, his Secretary of Commerce quietly enacted rules which will pretty much destroy the fishing industry in uh, the Atlantic coast, eliminating the regulations that have been controlling uh, uh, the level of fishing to prevent overfishing. The agenda of the uh, government is Paul Ryan's Who, who? It's Ryan McConnell. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a wing, an extremist, rather savage wing of the Republican Steve Party. Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon is, nobody knows just what he's doing. He's a figure in the background. Uh, maybe Rasputin, <laughs> if we want an analogy. Who's got an, he has his own picture. Very clear. He's explicit. He wants a, a white Christian America, and uh, nothing else belongs. Uh, he and, in fact, Jeff Sessions, Secretary, the Attorney General, agreed on this. And they're acting in the background in one or another way. But if you look at the cabinet, it's uh, Wall Street, Goldman Sachs, uh, the, most, the most conservative uh, reactionary elements of the Republican Party. Actually, what's going on with the health bill is very instructive. Mm -hmm. uh, every proposal that's coming from the Republicans Uh, as soon as it's analyzed by the Congressional Budget Office, turns out it's uh, eliminating health care for 20 or 30 million people. Now, the U.S. system is already a, the health system is a scandal. It's about uh, twice the per capita cost of other com comparable In countries Europe, and, uh, yes. and relatively poor outcomes. Uh, the Obama change has improved it somewhat. But for seven years, the Republicans have had one uh, prime commitment on their agenda, destroy that, partly because Obama, because Obama initiated it, and they have to eliminate mm -hmm. Obama. And, and in terms of foreign policy, what can you say about Trump, the Trump foreign policy? Well, actually, in some aspects of foreign policy, I think his position is... 
uh, somewhat more sensible, whatever the reasons are for it. He, is, he has made efforts uh, to try to reduce tensions with Russia, which makes very good sense. Uh, the threat of accidental war on the Russian border is very high. Any serious strategic analyst is terrified by the prospects. And uh, while Congress, including the Democrats, is, is, increase, is acting to increase the tensions, Trump seems to be trying to control and limit them, whatever his reasons may be. It's very hard to figure out his reasons. But uh, speculate a bit for us. Do you think that why this appeasement with, with Russia, with Putin? Probably because he admires a strong authoritarian leader. It may be business interest. Mm -hmm. uh, but whatever the reasons, uh, reducing the tensions does make sense. Uh, in the case of uh, other areas, um, take, say, we're, we're regularly informed daily that uh, the major threat that we face is North Korea. Uh, and the tensions are, are, are growing up there. And the tensions are developing. Now, there happens to be a very simple way of approaching the North Korean uh, dilemma, namely accept the North Korean offer to do exactly what we're asking them to do. Uh, we're demanding that they freeze their the nuclear, nuclear weapons program. and missile programs, and that's exactly what they've offered. Uh, China and North Korea have proposed that. Uh, in fact, they did two years ago under Obama. It was rejected then, it's rejected now. And the reason it's rejected is because there's a quid pro quo uh, that the United States call off threatening military maneuvers uh, right at the North Korean border. Uh, Trump, for example, has even escalated that by sending a nuclear-capable uh, B-52s uh, to fly right at the border, uh, ships near the border and so on. Uh, North Korea may be the worst regime in the world, but uh, they want to, the, the regime wants to survive. Okay? So one perfectly sensible possibility would be to accept the Chinese-North Korean offer for freezing their programs and move on towards negotiations which might carry things forward. And they might succeed. If you look mm -hmm. at the record, uh, the actual record, uh, it does show that uh, uh, whatever one thinks about the regime, they play a kind of tit-for-tat game. If you offer them something, they give something back. You, you are a critic of Obama. It's possible to compare the Obama administration, eight years, with the six months of Trump? Uh, the six months of Trump are a real horror story. <laughs> Domestically, it's just tearing to shreds every uh, constructive element in social and economic policy. I mean, they're the cutting back of, uh, I mean, the worst element, the most dangerous element, is his position on climate. Mm -hmm. And that's not Trump. That's the, the, the Paris Conference. That it's is. the Republican Party. Every you take a look at the primaries last year. Every single candidate, without exception, either denied that what is happening is happening, or said maybe it is, but we shouldn't do anything about it. In fact, the Paris negotiations, which you mentioned, were aimed at a verifiable treaty, mm -hmm. but they couldn't reach it because the Republican Congress wouldn't accept it. Uh, Trump is an extreme example of Republican denialism. And this is a matter of survival of the species. Today, what's most danger? The climate catastrophe or the nuclear weapons? Both. Both. Uh, the different in character. The climate catastrophe is coming unless we do something about it. Uh, nuclear war is a threat that we've been living with for 70 years. And if you look at the record, which is shocking. Uh, there has been case after case of very close uh, approach to disaster. I mean, there is sig very significant information that unfortunately the media are simply not reporting. Uh -huh. So, for example, in March, uh, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, the main scientific journal dealing with strategic nuclear weapons, had an extremely important article in which some of the leading specialists on the topic uh, analyzed the modernization programs 
that Obama instituted and that Trump is carrying forward. And what they showed is that the a kill capacity has increased enormously to the point where there is now a first strike capacity, mm -hmm. which would wipe out the Russian deterrent. And as they point out, this erodes the very slender thread on which stability has uh, uh, hung for many years. It okay. means that, uh, as they put it, this is the kind of program that would be carried out by a state aiming at a first strike, which will eliminate any retaliation. The Russians, of course, understand okay. that. Mm -hmm. This is extremely dangerous. Nós vamos fazer um pequeno intervalo e já voltamos com o professor Noam Chomsky. Voltamos com o professor Noam Chomsky, linguista e ativista político americano. Professor Chomsky, tell me, do you think that uh, there is a decadence of the American empire in the world, his power? That's a little misleading. Mm -hmm. The American empire hit its peak of power in 1945. At that point, the United States had probably about half of the wealth of the world, uh, total security, controlled the hemisphere, uh, the oceans, the opposite sides of the oceans, uh, other industrial powers had been seriously harmed or virtually destroyed. The U.S. economy boomed during mm -hmm. the war, manufacturing uh, quadrupled, uh, it was laid the basis for enormous post-war expansion. Uh, that was the peak of American power. It started to decline almost immediately. The first significant decline was in 1949. China. When what is called, interestingly, the loss of China. <laughs> a very interesting and revealing phrase. Uh -huh. And uh, that's the basis for McCarthyism and who was responsible for the loss of China and so on. And gradually the world began to recover from wartime disaster. Uh, decolonization proceeded in its agonizing way. The world got more diverse. If you reach, say, 1970, uh, the world was economically tripolar. Mm -hmm. There was a North American base of power based in the United States, uh, European base uh, centered in Germany, uh, uh, East Asian base at that time centered in Japan, now including the East Asian tigers in China, and uh, uh, U.S. wealth was maybe 20% of the world. That's still enormous, but not 50%. Of course, U.S. Uh, and since then, it's kind of stabilized. Uh, th this is misleading, however, in several ways. Why? Well, one reason is that the traditional measure of national economic power is in terms of what are called national accounts, like gross domestic product. Mm -hmm. But the way the world has changed in the last 20 years, that's no longer a very accurate measure. If you, take, if you look at the world economy from a different point of view, who owns the world? Turns out that U.S. corporations, multinationals, mm -hmm. own about 50% of uh, the world economy. Now, that's not U.S. power, but it's corporate power based in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, furthermore, if you look at the military dimension, Uh, the US so the US is uh, nobody's even close. What do you think it's the place of Latin America, of Brazil, in this world? Uh, that's a choice that Latin America has to make. If you go back a century, 1920s, um, read the Wall Street Journal, they were describing Brazil as the potential colossus of the South, comparable to the colossus of the North. Had huge resources, uh, uh, faced no real external dangers, uh, 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 politically um, sophisticated, uh, educated populations, every reason for it to become, especially Brazil, uh, but all of Latin America, uh, another center of power in the world. Uh, it hasn't happened. In fact, the one time it really began to happen was during Lula's government, when along with his very competent foreign secretaries, Cesar Amarim, uh, the Lula government was able to turn Brazil into one of the 
significant actors on the world stage. Uh, but uh, the, it, it simply has not been sustainable. Why? In fact, it's, why? It's, why do you, it's very why? striking to see why. It's interesting, for example, to compare, say, East Asia with Latin America, say, Brazil with South Korea. If you go back, uh, say, to 1960, uh, uh, South Korea was at the level of a poor African country. Uh, take a look, the next, Brazil was much richer per capita in, I mean, it's highly unequal in Brazil, but mm -hmm. you know, over, uh, overall the average per capita income was much higher. Uh, the next uh, 20 years, 1960 to 1980, uh, both countries uh, had a substantial growth rate, pretty comparable, and then it stops. South Korea continues to grow and develop, becomes a major industrial power. Uh, Brazil went through the famous 20 law, two lost decades. Uh, mm -hmm. By now, uh, Brazilian uh, per capita income is, uh, I think, a quarter or half of South Korea's. Uh, and this is across the board, Latin America and East Asia. Yes. If you ask why, uh, there, I think there has been good analysis of it. Uh, Latin America has never controlled its elites. The wealthy sectors basically have no responsibility to the country. They do what they want. Uh, they export capital. They import luxury goods. Uh, right. the, the East Asia is quite different. They're under control. But why the populism, the left populism in Latin America did not work at the end? Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina, even Bolivia. Why this, well, this end, melancholic end? I don't think it's an end. I think it's don't, a don't you think it's period of regression. But there are a lot of achievements which I think will remain. So take Brazil. Uh, on the, uh, lots of things were wrong, but many things were good. So the, uh, um, the, uh, there was a sharp decrease in poverty, uh, uh, improvement in uh, educational standards. Uh, but they lost the power, and they lost. there is a, a regression now. There, there's a regression, but I suspect it will come back. I don't think this has happened over and over. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, for, for the, the fundamental reason is the failure of uh, Latin American societies to control the uh, concentrations of wealth and capital and elite power and to deal with the uh, radical problem of inequality. I mean, the Latin American countries have ample resources. Uh, they're in a much better position to develop than East Asia. Uh, no enemies. Uh, uh, however, the policies that have been pursued have been quite different. So in East Asia, for example, say South Korea, Taiwan, they followed the Japanese model. Mm -hmm. uh, they welcomed investment, but it was targeted. It was used under careful planning for development. Uh, at the same time, uh, Latin America was importing uh, capital, but luxury goods, not capital goods and not targeting them. Do you they, think that corruption is the main problem in Latin America or not? It's a problem, but a serious problem, but it's a problem everywhere. Everywhere. I um, mean, even in Spain, even in the United in the United States, it's dramatic. Depends what we call corruption. Like uh, put it, take Apple computers, the biggest biggest mm. company in the world. Uh, they succeed in uh, barely paying any taxes, but we don't call it corruption. What it amounts to is uh, establishing a, an office in Ireland and saying that's the company, uh, or putting uh, uh, about. Uh, in the 1990s, just as an illustration, there was a period, you may recall, of great enthusiasm about emerging markets and how wonderful it was to invest in emerging markets, in Latin America in particular. So, out of curiosity, I subscribed to the uh, uh, Department of Commerce regular reports. They give detailed reports of every economic statistic you can imagine. And one of them is foreign direct investment in, la in the Western Hemisphere, excluding mm. Canada, okay. which is part of Europe. And it was very interesting. It turned out about 25% of it went to Bermuda. 15% mm -hmm. uh, went to the British Caribbean islands. 10% went to Panama. 
Well, that wasn't to build steel mills. And but we don't corruption. It, we don't call it corruption. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a huge amount of money. Mm. You know. One last question, Mr. Chomsky. After so many years, you are 88 years old, a young man. Do you think that the human species are getting better? That we are happier today than the, in the past? Happier is hard to judge, yes. but uh, I think there has been there have been advances. Uh, so, for example, uh, 50 percent of the world's population are women. Uh, there have been great advances in women's rights. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, 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 civil rights generally. There's been substantial improvement. Uh, there is now uh, concern, serious concern, for the very significant threat of environmental catastrophe. And 50 years ago, there was nothing. Uh, there's much more opposition, and take the United States, opposition to aggression is far higher than it was in the past. The United States could not possibly do something like uh, the invasion of Indochina, the worst crime since the Second World War. That's out of the question. Uh, lots of things to criticize, some of them pretty awful, but uh, there's a general slow improvement uh, with periods of regression. You are an optimist, so. <laughs> It's, um, the choices are to be an optimist and to do what you can to make things better, or to be a pessimist and ensure that the worst will happen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Chomsky. I'm an admirer. I have studied your work as linguistic and I admire your intellectually. Nós ficamos por aqui e voltamos na próxima quinta-feira, depois de termos a honra de termos recebido o professor Noam Chomsky. Até lá. <música>